to say uh, praise God and welcome uh, everyone here to the way you've been welcomed already, but it's good to be back in the space with you. I am uh, Ben McBride, Pastor Ben McBride, Reverend Ben McBride, your brother in the struggle, Pastor Mike Stunt Double. Amen. You know, everybody's got to have a stunt double every now and then. And so I thank God that I get the chance uh, to be the, the stunt double of who I like to call the famous McBride, Pastor Mike McBride. Uh, we're so thankful for him and for all of you uh, being a part of this moment as we gather this morning to think about what it is that God might be speaking to us and inviting us into. And so I'm grateful that I get a chance to step into your living room, into your bed room. Well, I'm not coming to your bedroom. I'm just at the door, praise God. Like, I'm just knocking a little bit, right? You know, uh, <laughs> somebody's watching me, right? So I'm just here to join with you. It's good to be here, uh, one and all. Just join me uh, in a quick word of prayer as we invite the Spirit of God uh, to lead us through this time of thinking about God's words. Lord, we give you praise because you are good and your mercy endures forever. If it had not been for you who was on our side, we would have been swallowed up by our enemies. But we are thankful to you who has given us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as we take these moments to think about your words, to think about the stories and the principles that come to us through the scriptures. Our prayer, Lord, is that your spirit would illuminate our minds, that you would speak not what Ben wants to say, but to speak what your spirit needs us to hear in this moment for the world that you're creating, for the people that you are reconciling, for the ways in which you are seeking to save our souls, bodies, and to change our communities. Lord, we give this time to you. Speak to us. We will be those who are not just hearers of the word, but doers of it. We say it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to be in the room. I'm going to be preaching today out of our lectionary passage uh, here in the book of Jonah, the third uh, chapter. Now, I got to tell you with this lectionary passage, I'm a little upset because, you know, the, the, the bad thing sometimes about these lectionary passages, for those who don't know, the lectionary is, is a set of scriptures where the church all around the world uh, joins and thinks about scriptures and preaches about shared scriptures. And as I was reading this scripture, I was like, I don't really want to preach about this, this scripture. I don't, I don't really like the conversation God's trying to have with me with this passage. You know, I, matter of fact, you know, I want to have a conversation with God about, you know, this whole story. I'm not feeling this. This doesn't go with my turn up right now that I'm feeling in my spirit. But maybe that's a part of the conversation today, that, that sometimes God is trying to disrupt what we think we need to be doing and what we think uh, we need to be saying. And God is really trying to speak to us about who God is calling us to be in this moment. Uh, Jonah chapter 3, and I'm going to read the 10th verse and then read through it into the 4th chapter up to the 5th verse. And the Bible reads, when God saw what they did, how they turned, speaking of the Ninevites, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. I want to talk to us for a few uh, moments today about these two words, love, mercy. Love, mercy. You know, we're, we're in a very interesting time, y'all. We, we in a crazy time. We just had uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one of the Supreme Court justice who, 
who just uh, transitioned and, and passed away a couple days ago. And, and I, I, it's no news to you that we have an authoritarian a fascist in the White House who is legislating and, and well, not legislating, but, but moving all kinds of, of violence through uh, our electoral system and through our governmental system. It's a crazy moment to be alive. It's a crazy moment for me to be black. It's, it's a crazy moment for you to be black, for you to be Latinx, for you to be Asian, for you to be indigenous. It's even a crazy experience for you to be white right now, praise God. The world is upside down. And I, it feels to me in moments like these that if we're not careful, we can find ourselves becoming caricatures of what we see other folks doing. And I think the Spirit might be inviting us to think about what is it that God is uniquely calling us to do as God's church who need to be faithful, not necessarily just to the energy of the moment, but faithful to that which the Spirit is calling us to do. In this, in this book of Jonah, I want to just give us a little bit of a review for, for those of us who, who may not know the story or haven't heard the story in some time. Jonah finds himself like many of us. Minding his business, trying to go about his uh, daily job, trying to uh, follow God, but probably also trying to eat a couple little fish along the way, have a little bit of a Starbucks Frappuccino with his fish along the way, trying to live his life. And God comes to Jonah and says, I want you to get up from your place of comfort and go over to that place to those people you do not like and carry a message from me to them. And Jonah finds himself not feeling that message, praise God, right? You know how we get when, when God is trying to disrupt our comfort and move us out of the place that we want to stay in, to send us into a place that stretches us, that disagrees with us. When God is trying to push on us to carry a message we don't want to carry, we oftentimes do what Jonah did when he found himself in that moment. He ran. Amen. Touch somebody in your house and say, he ran. Amen. Touch somebody next to you and say, we run. Right? You know how it is. When God is putting pressure on you to do what you don't want to do, you run. Matter of fact, some of us right now might be out of breath because you've been running all week because God's been trying to push you to go in a direction you don't want to go. Jonah found himself on the run. In the story, we, we see Jonah, uh, not only does he go on the run, but he gets on a boat. And he decides that he is going to go in the opposite uh, direction of Nineveh. He's going to go in the opposite direction of this place that God is calling Jonah to go to because Jonah does not want to go there. And as Jonah finds himself on the boat, the boat gets met with a storm. The storm comes to the boat and the people on the boat are trying to figure out what is it that is happening? Why are we finding ourselves dealing with this great challenge that we have in this moment? And they, they begin to wrestle among themselves and do a variety of different exercises to see why this calamity has come upon them. And they recognize, Jonah, it is you are the reason that we are having this problem on the boat. And so they threw Jonah over the boat into the water and the scripture says that Jonah got swallowed by a big fish and took Jonah down into the ocean to have a confrontation with God about God's mission for him. You know, I, I want to park right there before I go a little bit into where we are because I think many of us are finding ourselves in moments right now where not only have we been on the run from some of the things that God has been calling us to do, but we have been feeling the spirit of overwhelm. Have you been feeling a little overwhelmed in your life? Have you been feeling a sense of storm being all around you, not just personal storm and collective storm, but have you ever found yourself in a moment, maybe it's right now in your life, where it feels like the people who should hold you are throwing you over the boat into the water to have to deal with some of the challenges facing you by yourself? Have you ever found yourself in a storm, a storm personally, a storm on your job, a storm with your health, 
a storm that we've been dealing with with the police over the last not just three to four months, but the last 400 years. A storm in your community where we just had in Oakland a 16-year-old young sister who just lost her life to gun violence two days ago. A storm in the nation with COVID-19. Have you ever felt yourself in a storm? You know, I want to say to us in this moment that when we find ourselves in storms, rather than us putting pressure on ourselves to be perfect, I think we need to remember that God has mercy for you. That's the first point that I want to lift up, that God has mercy for you. You know, when we are trying to navigate these tough moments of life, too much of our society and sometimes even our religious orientation puts pressure on us to believe that we've got to be perfect that you've got to bat a thousand, that you've got to figure it out all right, that you're not going to make mistakes in your personal life or you're not going to mis make mistakes in your spiritual life or you're going to have the best kind of uh, ambiance around you all the time. And, and you're putting yourself under this undue stress when I want to tell you that God has mercy for you. God doesn't just have mercy for your perfection, but God's got mercy for the ways in which you can't figure it out. God's got mercy for the ways in which you're stressed. God's got mercy for your mess up. I wish you touch somebody in your house and say, mercy for the mess up. In moments of great trial, you need to know that God's got mercy for the mess up. Because if we don't have access to the mercy of God, what will we do? In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes, it wasn't so long ago that you were uh, mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let, uh, 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 you let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief, and then you exalted disobedience. We all did it, all of us doing what we felt like doing, when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us instead. Somebody say instead. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, God embraced us. God took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. God did all of this on his own with no help from us. God picked us up and set us down in the highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. God has mercy for you. And I want us to really understand that because in moments of great challenge, we need to receive the mercy of God. God's got mercy for you to be upset. God's got mercy for you to lose it. God's got mercy for you to be depressed. God's got mercy for you to be mad at God. Listen, God's got mercy for you to doubt God. God has mercy for you. Jonah found himself when he got to the bottom of the ocean in the belly of the fish. And, and there's a powerful prayer when you get other time. Go ahead and read the book uh, of Jonah. I like to say it in the King James Version uh, where, where it says that they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. This is what Jonah prays to God in the belly of the fish. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee. Jonah says, I will sacrifice unto thee. I will receive your mercy and I will offer sacrifice unto thee. And then the, the story tells us that Jonah gets spat out of the fish with the opportunity, having received mercy from God, to get on the journey of what God was calling Jonah to do. Now, here's the challenge now that we get into is that Jonah finds himself, as we come into chapter 3, Jonah finds himself on his way to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is a place, you know where Nineveh is. It's the place you don't want to go that's populated by the people you don't like. Somebody ought to say amen, right? You know exactly what I'm talking about. God tell, tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to declare judgment on these wicked people. Is there any wicked people you got in your mind right now? 
Amen. Anybody you feel like casting some judgment around? Any of y'all seeing some injustice happening right now? Any of y'all seeing some unrighteousness happening right now? And, 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 and in the story, God tells Jonah, I want you to go to, to Nineveh uh, to tell them uh, to bring a message of judgment uh, about uh, them wanting to make Nineveh great again. I'm just, I'm, I'm just kidding. You, 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 you caught that reference, right? God, God, God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and to declare a message of judgment. Now, Jonah gets to Nineveh. I'm going to speed ahead a little bit because I want us to get this. Jonah gets to Nineveh. He preaches the message of judgment. And in the story, the king in Nineveh repents. The Ninevites repent and God in Jonah chapter 3 where we pick up verse 10 the Bible says that God changes God's mind about the judgment he was going to bring upon the Ninevites now this is a hard passage for me y'all I, I, I got to tell you and and I want to have a little conversation I, I want to stop preaching for a moment I want to have a little conversation right because if we keep it all the way solid, I mean, not y'all, y'all very spiritual people all at home, y'all, y'all drinking anointing oil in your coffee for breakfast and all of that. But for those of us who are not as spiritual, there are some people right now in our society who I have personally declared are not worthy of the mercy of God. Well, I haven't declared it, but in my house I declare, right? Y'all know when I'm watching the news, I'm like, these people don't need no mercy. These people need the judgment of God. These people need the hammer of God. These people need the heat, amen, of God, right? These people need the judgment because their actions are wicked, because they have aligned themselves with unrighteousness, because they have plundered the poor and the oppressed, Right? And, and I found myself in that orientation. And this scripture is very disruptive for me. Because in the story, the people who God gave Jonah a word to declare judgment for, the Bible says that God changed God's mind about bringing judgment to the Ninevites. And Jonah got so caught up with his word of judgment that he lost the ability to also hold God's paradigm of mercy. So I want to say one thing, like God has mercy for you, but God, my second point, also has mercy for them. I think one of the things that's hard to hold, saints of God, and listen, I'm itching right now as I'm standing up here. I'm about to fall down. They're going to have to do CPR on me, praise God, is that we must make sure that mercy is God's alone to give. That redemption is God's alone to give. And so then I've been asking myself over the last week as I've been reflecting on the scripture, Lord, what is it that you are speaking to us out of this? And I feel what the spirit has been saying is that while mercy is mine to give, I need you, Ben, to make sure that you always have the capacity to be a vehicle of my mercy. I, you should not allow your own pain and your struggle to overwhelm you to the degree that you lose the ability to be an instrument of mercy and an instrument of redemption. That God says, I've got mercy for you and I am inviting you not to become the very thing you have aboard, but to be an instrument of mercy because God says that there is not just mercy for you, Ben. There is also mercy for the people you don't like. There is not just mercy for you who have been the person who has experienced the racism, but with repentance, and I want to say this, right, with repentance, and I would even argue reparation as a part of true repentance, that God, it is God's to give mercy 
to those with whom God would give mercy. And so I believe that one of the things that this passage is disrupting us around is how do we allow ourselves to be shaped not in the image of this world, but to be shaped in the image of God. That if mercy is available for you, how can you say mercy is available for me and yet mercy is not available for anyone else? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, judge not lest you be judged. And with the same judgment that you give out, it will be judged back to you. And also, I believe that frame applies to mercy. That with the same measure of mercy you meet out, mercy will be met back to you. And this is why I believe that God's spirit wants to continue to call us to ensure that love is the sail that is guiding our ship. There, there's a quote I have about, about pain and love because it's hard to hold love when we've been through a lot of pain. Y'all throw that quote up on the, on the screen. Pain may well remind us that we are alive, but love reminds us why we are alive. Pain reminds us we are alive, but love reminds us why we are alive. And so I think it's important for us to make sure that we recognize that God doesn't just have mercy for us, but God's got mercy for them. And as we are building power, and y'all know we're trying to build some power over the next two months because we have got to get this person out of the White House, praise God. We've got somebody who needs to repent. Donald Trump needs to repent. I may have just broken a C3 law, but, but I'm not on staff at the Way Christian Center, so send your letters to me, amen, because you won't be able to find me anyway, praise God, right? He needs to repent from his wickedness, and all of the MAGA folks that have been following him need to repent from their wickedness. And we must declare their need and their responsibility to repent. But we must make sure that we do so rooted in God's love, not in the world's hatred. That God's love calls for repentance because we also were dead in our sins. And Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for you when you had it right. Christ died for you when you had it wrong. Oh, I wish I had a witness. Christ died for you, not when you was batting a thousand. Christ died for you when you were striking out. Come on, somebody. And so God's mercy is not just available for those who've got it together. God's mercy is available for those who don't have it together. Jesus said, I did not come to those who think, that, who, who think they can see. I came to those who were blind. So as we build power, we must build power to change our world rooted in love. Dr. King says power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. God is calling us as people of God to be those who are instruments of mercy, not gatekeepers of judgment. And so what is the purpose? Some of y'all have heard me say this over and over. What is the purpose of leaving Egypt and leaving bondage if you become Pharaoh on your sojourn to the promised land. God is calling us to become instruments of mercy. In Matthew chapter 20, another one of our lectionary passages, you find this parable where there, there was a bunch of uh, folks who showed up. Uh, to, to work in the field. And, and the master said, I'm going to give uh, uh, this person this amount and you go work in the field all day. And then someone else came a couple hours later and, and said, I'm, and, G, and, and the master says, I'm going to give you this much and you go work in the day. And so folks came towards the, 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 the twilight hour and the master said, I'm going to give you this much and you go work for the rest of the day. And then some folks came at the 11th hour 
And the master said, I'm going to give you this much. You go work for the day. And when everybody had been working all day, they found out that the people who started in the beginning of the morning got paid the same amount as those that showed up an hour before the shift was over. And the people who came early were angry with the master around why did you pay these people all that you paid them when I've worked all day. And the master said, did you not agree to actually uh, work for this amount? What does it matter? to you if I gave them the, the same pay that you got in the beginning and here's what we need to recognize in our life when we start getting all self-righteous in every area of your life you are somebody who started early in the day or somebody who showed up late maybe when it comes to justice you showed up early in the morning but it came to your righteousness you showed up late maybe in your marriage you're the person that showed up early but on your job you showed up late maybe in other parts of your life in your community you showed up early but in other parts in the church you showed up late we not need be focused on who's getting paid what and when but how are we doing the work of God allowing God to bring mercy to who God brings mercy we are called to love mercy not be gatekeepers of judgment you know, Micah 6, verse 8 says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. God is calling us to be more than just partisan hacks in a very polarized political arena. Now, I'm not smirching the need for us to do our political work, but what I am inviting us is for us not to forget that our faith is not a condiment on our life's entree. That our faith is meant to be the main course. That our faith is meant to ground the way that we see the world. That there's no way that you can follow a Jesus who laid down his life for people he called friends who at the time saw him as enemy. There's no way you can follow that Jesus and then not seek to live a life that in itself is an instrument of that same mercy. Jesus, I'm about to mess with some of y'all did not call for you to worship him. Jesus called for you to follow him. Jesus said, if you love me, don't sing a song to me. If you love me, don't just lift your hands to me. If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments and what is his commandments to love the Lord your God with all your mind heart soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself what are his commandments is to not uh, uh, hate your enemy but to love your enemy there is no way to follow Jesus and not embrace the practice of enemy love I told y'all this is a hard word for me to preach because I halfway don't agree with what I'm saying. Amen. <laughs> but I always say that if God is always agreeing with what you already believe, that's not God. The Spirit is trying to call us into being sacrificial people who follow a crucified Jesus, one who recognized that the age to come was bigger than the moment he was in. And that what he needed to do in his moment was to live into God's call for him, that he might open up the floodgates for the moments that we have. And I wanna say to us that we must recognize that if God's got mercy for us, then God's got mercy for them I mean, if God's got mercy for you, God's got mercy for them. And if God's got mercy for you and mercy for them, then that means God has mercy for us. What do I mean by us? I mean that we must keep in mind that at the end of the story in the scriptures is God reconciling all things. It says, I am bringing in a new heaven and a new earth. 
and the old heaven and the old earth are passed away. And there will be no more tears. And God will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. And we will live in peace. Regardless as to where your eschatology lands, whether you believe that happens uh, before the return of Christ or after the return of Christ, what we are called is that God, what we are called and commanded is to work towards the world of God making all things as they should be. And I think it's important for us to recognize with Jonah that Jonah finds himself at the end of his story having missed the window that God had for Jonah. Jonah had allowed himself to become so consumed with his desire for the Ninevites to get judgment that when God made a turn towards mercy, Jonah became angry. He became so angry that he prayed to the Lord to take his life. Jonah allowed his pain, justifiable pain, and anger and frustration to overwhelm him to the degree that he sought now for the ending of his own life. We must be those who do not disappear the power of injustice and unrighteousness that we see. We must continue to work towards undoing it, but we must continue to bring ourselves to God, to continue to be made into the instruments of mercy, the instruments of love, the instruments of justice. And somebody might say, well, Ben, what are you saying then? Are you saying we just need to turn down and go hug it out with all these racist people in the parking lot? No. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that we must not allow ourselves to let our own flesh and vanity and vain glory become our God. That we must allow God, the only God, to continue to make us into who God is calling us to be so that wherever God sends us and to whomever God sends us, our answer will always be yes. Love mercy. God is calling us to love mercy and to be the people that God is calling for in these last and evil days. And so I want to invite you in this moment to think about how can you allow the mercy of God to come to you afresh. There's some reflection questions we have to just put in front of you, maybe to think about your own life. Go and throw the reflection questions up. In what ways do you need to stop judging yourself and accept God's mercy for your humanness? What ways do you need to stop judging yourself? Giving yourself a break, you've been beating yourself up. In what ways do you need to stop judging yourself and accept God's mercy? for your humanness with whom are you carrying judgment for that you need to extend mercy to we don't want to allow bitterness and unforgiveness and arrogance to calcify hearts that must remain flesh in order for god to permeate them with whom are you carrying judgment for that you need to extend mercy to and where are you inviting the holy spirit to expand love inside of you. No greater love hath any man than he would lay down his life, her life, their life for their friends. Let me say a prayer for us. Oh God, we need you. Like the deer needs water, we need you. Lord, we need your mercy today because we are struggling through some of the most difficult moments of our collective lives. And Lord, we know that we need things to change in our cities, in our neighborhoods, in our country, and around the world. God, we need you. People are unhoused because of the decisions made by wicked leaders, Lord. Uh, people are without food. People are losing their lives. Some of us are out of work, and families are challenged because of things that are happening. God, we need you, and we need your mercy. But God, we ask that as you 
bring your mercy to us would you build in us the capacity to be instruments of mercy to carry to others Lord, we need you and we invite your Holy Spirit to rain down mercy upon us where we are. Come into our living rooms. Come into our bedrooms. Come into our cars. Come to us where we are and let us experience the Spirit of God that we might join you in the world that you are making. We give your name praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.